Hello and welcome to Fortnite News, Kazan Federal University's English news program. We will discuss a range of topics from our alma mater to education and science in Russia and the world at large. My name is Grace and I'm your host for today. A year ago, the world was forced to come to a standstill due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Lockdowns and restrictions were put in place and our life turned into an online episode. Everything was done remotely. No one imagined the infection would grow exponentially to today's scale. Scientists, especially biologists, geneticists, and virologists were put under the spotlight. With lives on the line, the race to find a COVID-19 vaccine began. Due to the global spread and the mortality of the infection, making a vaccine was a very crucial task. Russian scientists were the first to succeed, producing three vaccines in a very short time. The vaccine is in abundance. Everyone can receive a shot and breathe a bit easier. The ways of preventing and treating COVID-19 were discussed at Kazan Federal University. Junior year student of the Institute of International Relations, Andrei Fomichov, has been lucky enough not to deal with the coronavirus infection. However, his social circle has been less fortunate. Some of his friends and relatives went through the disease. That's why, after finding out that his groupmates started getting vaccinated, he decided to follow their example. At my dorm, I found out that I can get inoculated at the student clinic, and I was compelled to come here to do that because it means reducing the risk of infection. I think it's better to do that if there is such an opportunity. I decided that side effects are not very critical, and it's probably better to get a shot than to get sick. As epidemiologists say, there is no specific preparation protocol for vaccination. Before the shot, the patient fills in a questionnaire and gets a checkup from a general practitioner. After that, they receive a leaflet on post-vaccination precautions. It's inadvisable to swim and to do sports during three days after vaccination, and you should exclude alcohol. There are acceptable reactions such as fever, malaise and weakness, but they pass after one or two days. The university's research community, including the Institute of Fundamental Medicine and Biology, has been keeping their finger on the pulse of the problem since the emergence of COVID-19 and suggest their ways of dealing with the problem linked with the treatment and prevention of this disease. We have our in-house clinic and within it we opened a COVID ward some time ago and learned to treat people one way or the other. But there are still many problems stemming from the consequences of this ailment. And that's why I want this topic to also be discussed here. Many aspects of the treatment and prevention of COVID-19 were discussed in detail during a meeting with Vadim Govurum, director of the Federal Center for Physiochemical Medicine of the Federal Medical Biological Agency, dedicating a good part of his hour and a half lecture to vaccination. Academician Govurum noted that both the producers of vaccines and types of vaccines are different. Subcutaneous, intramuscular, some people take pills and they also make yogurts in St. Petersburg. Whatever goes best, it's not important. What's important is to deliver a group of antigens or the C antigen to the target and to boost immunity. Initially, having faced this virus, doctors used protocols and established algorithms, but COVID was a real trial for clinicians because its therapeutic recommendations become obsolete so quickly. Vadim Govorum emphasized in particular that in Moscow now basically no one is transferred to lung ventilation or administered antibiotics from the get-go. Treatment techniques have changed because during the first half year of the pandemic, Doctors studied in detail the first 2,000 lethal cases of coronavirus. I think that our vaccine is not the least worse. I recommend it to everyone who is still thinking about vaccinating. Vaccination is the process that can now sharply decrease the concentration of this virus in the population through immunization, noted Vadim Govarun. During that half year, having processed what was going on, clinicians succeeded in getting patients out of this critical condition. This was predominantly achieved with the use of target immune medications. One cannot exclude that COVID will be mimic its typical story of disease evolution. The virus can change its localization, it replicates in the respiratory tract, but it may start replicating somewhere else. And timely detection of such processes directly influences the quality of medical care. In the same way as such meetings influence the accumulation of experience which experts exchange with each other. The university management wants to conduct such seminars regularly. Why is it important to vaccinate quickly and not at a snail pace? The Americans make two million shots a day because they understand that in a month a relatively sizable immunized population will be produced and the virus will stop replicating. It's not a bacterium. It cannot lay idle in the ground. It has to replicate constantly. Can five or seven research disciplines be combined into one? It sounds impossible, but it is in fact possible. Let's take chromoinformatics for instance. It's the meeting point of chemistry, 
physics, informatics, biology, pharmacology, and mathematics. The only thing needed to join the research is a computer. And this profession is now taught at Kazan Federal University. Chemist of Kazan University and invited professor Alexandra Varnik from Statsburg University used the achievements of IT to solve chemical problems. The work is based on the tandem of humans and the AI. Everything is done exclusively on a computer workstation. The problem is that we have to select an optimal composition for every well and every type of petroleum. We have to change the composition. Our task as chemo-informaticians is to predict which composition works better on this or that type of petroleum. In 2014, the Laboratory of Chemio-Informatics and Molecular Modeling was established. Timur Majindov was one of the founders of the lab. He was co-authored many papers in Russian and international journals with colleagues from Belgium, Switzerland, Japan, and France. He has been a recipient of the Arbuzov Prize, an award for contributions to fundamental and applied chemistry. Majidov himself, though, thinks one of his major achievements is co-authoring a textbook, more specifically, six textbooks on chemioinformatics. It's the only textbook on chemioinformatics in Russia. You saw the six volumes comprising about 2,000 pages. It was a titanic effort. It's planned that the textbook will be translated into other languages. One publishing house has already offered to issue an English version. In that case, this Kazan University's work will spread around the world quickly. Apart from that, the teams plan to file for a patent for a new technology of medication design. This project has been undertaken jointly with Palak University Alumni Czech Republic. A new specialized education and research center will be located at Kazan Federal University's Information Technology Lyceum. The university obtained grant funding from the federal government program targeted at preparing professionals for Russia's innovative economy sectors. Kazan Federal University came second in the program competition and was deemed the best in the development roadmap category. During the next three years, the university is poised to receive 600 million rubles. Kazan Federal University's IT, Lukim, has obtained 600 million rubles in grant funding to develop a specialized research and education center. In the next three years, the Lucium will upgrade its facilities and programs to further educate highly qualified professionals. This grant means that we must have at least 30 winners of Russian national competition in key subjects, such as mathematics and physics. There must also be international prize winners, and we must provide a high ratio of enrollments in leading Russian universities. We must attract young teachers, and there is also a requirement to involve students in this work. The grant is only assigned under certain circumstances, for instance, in terms of winners of various competitions. The IT, Lucium, is the best in the province and is among the top 100 secondary schools of Russia. This new grant will help teachers and pupils to travel abroad. Trips to Finland and Singapore are already in the plans, all funded by the Lucium itself. We are upgrading our infrastructure, planning to buy new lab equipment, renovate classrooms, buy textbooks, conduct competitions for our pupils and a national competition, send our boys and girls to national and international events. We haven't been always able to do that because of the expenses. 300 talented kids from all corners of Russia are studying here right now. They come from Bashkotorstan, Orenburg, Perm, Kemerovo, Kaliningrad, and even Kamchatka. They are taught to work as a team, not compete with each other. Their victories at various contests and events are, of course, to the merit of teachers. Many teachers have PhD degrees, highest professional teaching ranks. They have won numerous grants and accolades. Each one is a success story. In the Lyceum, academic contest training starts from seventh grade. It's customary for one kid to take up one contest to prepare. If they perform well, they can remain in the training movement. If not, they can undertake an individual project and then return to competition the next year. There are also kids who show great results in competitions, so we move them to an individual education track so that they can prepare for national contests. Last year, 10 of the IT Lucium graduates scored the absolute maximum of 100 points in their unified state exams. At Kazan University, if such young people choose to enroll, there is a special stipend from the rector. Grow your own talent and retain them. This is one of the most important objectives of any university, enterprise or locality. It is also one of the most pertinent issues for the city of Yalabuga in Tatarstan. The Alabuga Special Economic Zone has a large number of employers who always need qualified workers. That's why the new Alabuga Polytechnic Educational Center has already started educating high schoolers in the most popular professions for the local economy. 200 students are already receiving instruction at the Alabuga Polytech Educational Center. 
They have all recently graduated from ninth grade. The center prepares high schoolers for prospective employment at the local Alabuga Special Economic Zone. The Economic Zone residents are in need of specific professionals, and without this new center, the previously existing vocational schools were not able to satisfy such demand of the residents. There was a question of what kids should do in the future. In order to retain precious talents from leaving their home to seek education in Kazanian universities, the young graduates needed something to be stimulated to stay in Ilabuga. The development of Alabuga Polytech Center was one of the topics for discussion with the provincial government. Here, the opening ceremony was also held on the 5th of April. The opening of Alabuga Polytech is an example of a successful partnership between employers and educational institutions as a part of preparing workers in vocational schools. Rector of Kazan University Ilshad Gafurov shared plans to cooperate with Alabuga Polytech in higher education. As he said, the Alabuga Institute of Kazan Federal University has all the necessary capabilities to streamline educational trajectories all through vocational school, higher school and subsequent employment. This institute can accommodate the necessary departments so that vocational school graduates could smoothly transition here and receive higher education while retaining their communication with employers. The rector noted that Kazan University has more than once proven that it can undertake and finalize big educational projects. Cooperation with Alabuga Polytech can surely become one such example. April is the month when we remember Shahabuddin Marjani, a Tatar theologian and educator who was also an ethnographer, an expert in Oriental studies and the most prominent Tatar historian of his time. Marjani's enlightenment teachings cover various aspects of the social life of Tatar people. His words are very much still pertinent and so many scholars make reference to his ideas. Some of his original publications are stored in the section of manuscripts and rare books at Kazan University's Lobachevsky Library. Shahabuddin Marjani authored over 30 books in Arabic, Persian and Tatar languages. His interests comprise theology, history, literature and language. His most well-known work is a fundamental treatise on the history of Tatar people, the treasury of facts about the deeds of Kazan and Bulgar, written in 1885. It was the first ever research of the ethnic history of Tatars. While preparing for writing that work, Marjani visited the remains of ancient Bulgar, as well as Russian, Tatar, Chuvash and Mordovian villages. In the text, he actively promoted the ethnonym Tatars, explaining who are these people, what's their history and feats, and what they can be proud of. Marjani's ideas pertain to various facets of the social life of Tatars. He promoted general laic education, ancient heritage, including the thought of antiquity and the Arabic world, and the necessary to study contemporary culture of Russia and the Western Europe. He laid the foundation of an educational reform in madrasas to allow Tatars to get access to the vast wealth of global culture and science. Marjani was extremely fond of history and was well acquainted with historians and Oriental study scholars of his time. His works are available at the Lobachevsky Library of Kazan Federal University. That's all for this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.